United States v. Wong Kim Ark, 169 U.S. 649, 1898, is a United States Supreme Court case in which the court ruled that a child born in the United States, of parents of Chinese descent, who, at the time of his birth, are subjects of the Emperor of China, but have a permanent domicile and residence in the United States, and are there carrying on business, and are not employed in any diplomatic or official capacity under the Emperor of China, automatically became a U.S. citizen at birth. This decision established an important precedent in its interpretation of the Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Chinese-American Cook Wong Kim Ark, who was born in San Francisco in 1873, had been denied re-entry to the United States after a trip abroad, under a law restricting Chinese immigration and prohibiting immigrants from China from becoming naturalized U.S. citizens. He challenged the government's refusal to recognize his citizenship, and the Supreme Court ruled in his favor, holding that the citizenship language in the 14th Amendment encompassed the circumstances of his birth and could not be limited in its effect by an act of Congress. The case highlighted disagreements over the precise meaning of one phrase in the Citizenship Clause namely, the provision that a person born in the United States who is subject to the jurisdiction thereof acquires automatic citizenship. The Supreme Court's majority concluded that this phrase referred to being required to obey U.S. law, on this basis, they interpreted the language of the 14th Amendment in a way that granted U.S. citizenship to children born of foreigners on American soil, a concept known as Jew solely, with only a limited set of exceptions mostly based in English common law. The court's dissenters argued that being subject to the jurisdiction of the United States meant not being subject to any foreign power that is, not being claimed as a citizen by another country via Jew sanguinis, inheriting citizenship from a parent, an interpretation which, in the minority's view, would have excluded the children of foreigners, happening to be born to them while passing through the country. In the words of a 2007 legal analysis of events following the Wong Kim Ark decision, the parameters of the Jew Soli principle, as stated by the court in Wong Kim Ark, have never been seriously questioned by the Supreme Court, and have been accepted as dogma by lower courts. A 2010 review of the history of the Citizenship Clause notes that the Wong Kim Ark decision held that the guarantee of birthright citizenship applies to children of foreigners present on American soil and states that the Supreme Court has not re-examined this issue since the concept of illegal alien entered the language. Since the 1990s, however, controversy has arisen over the long-standing practice of granting automatic citizenship to U.S. born children of illegal immigrants, and legal scholars disagree over whether the Wong Kim Ark precedent applies when alien parents are in the country illegally. Attempts have been made from time to time in Congress to restrict birthright citizenship, either via statutory redefinition of the term jurisdiction, or by overriding both the Wong Kim Ark ruling and the Citizenship Clause itself through an amendment to the Constitution, but no such proposal has been enacted. Background Early History of United States Citizenship Law United States Citizenship Law is founded on two traditional principles Jew Soli, Right of the Soil, a Common Law Doctrine, and Jew Sanguinis, Right of the Blood, a Civil Law Doctrine. Under Jew Soli, a child's citizenship would be acquired by birth within a country's territory, without reference to the political status or condition of the child's parents. Under Jew Sanguinis, the citizenship of a child would not depend on his or her place of birth, but instead follow the status of a parent, specifically, the father or, in the case of an illegitimate birth, the mother. Throughout the history of the United States, the dominant legal principle governing citizenship has been due solely the principle that birth within the territorial limits of the United States confers automatic citizenship, excluding slaves before the American Civil War. Although there was no actual definition of citizenship in United States law until after the Civil War, it was generally accepted that anyone born in the United States was automatically a citizen. This applicability of due solely, via the common law inherited in the United States from England, was upheld in an 1844 New York State case, Lynch v. Clark, in which it was held that a woman born in New York City, of alien parents temporarily sojourning there, was a U.S. citizen. 
United States citizenship could also be acquired at birth via Jew Sanguinis, birth outside the country to a citizen parent, a right confirmed by Congress in the Naturalization Act of 1790. Additionally, alien immigrants to the United States could acquire citizenship via a process of naturalization though access to naturalization was originally limited to free white person. African slaves were originally excluded from United States citizenship. In 1857, the United States Supreme Court held in Dred Scott v. Sandford that slaves, former slaves, and their descendants were not eligible under the Constitution to be citizens. Additionally, American Indians were not originally recognized as citizens, since Indian tribes were considered to be outside the jurisdiction of the U.S. government. Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War and the subsequent abolition of slavery, Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1866. One provision of this law declared as citizens, not only the freed slaves, but all persons born in the United States and not subject to any foreign power, excluding Indians not taxed. Concerns were raised that the citizenship guarantee in the Civil Rights Act might be repealed by a later Congress or struck down as unconstitutional by the courts. Soon after the passage of the Act, Congress drafted the 14th Amendment to the Constitution and sent it to the states for ratification, a process which was completed in 1868. Among the 14th Amendment's many provisions was the Citizenship Clause, which entrenched a guarantee of citizenship in the Constitution by stating, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. The Citizenship Clause was proposed by Senator Jacob M. Howard of Michigan on May 30, 1866, as an amendment to the joint resolution from the House of Representatives which had framed the initial draft of the proposed 14th Amendment. The heated debate on the proposed new language in the Senate focused on whether Howard's proposed language would apply more broadly than the wording of the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Howard said that the clause is simply declaratory of what I regard as the law of the land already, that every person born within the limits of the United States, and subject to their jurisdiction, is by virtue of natural law and national law a citizen of the United States. He added that citizenship will not, of course, include persons born in the United States who are foreigners, aliens, who belong to the families of ambassadors or foreign ministers accredited to the government of the United States, but will include every other class of persons a comment which would later raise questions as to whether Congress had originally intended that U.S. born children of foreign parents were to be included as citizens. Responding to concerns expressed by Edgar Cowan of Pennsylvania that liberalizing the right to citizenship might result in certain states being taken over by large populations of undesirable foreign immigrants, John Connors of California predicted that the Chinese population in California would likely remain very small, in large part because Chinese immigrants almost always eventually return to China, and also because very few Chinese women left their homeland to come to the United States. James R. Doolittle of Wisconsin objected that the citizenship provision would not be sufficiently narrow to exclude American Indians from citizenship, and in an attempt to address this issue, he proposed to add a phrase taken from the Civil Rights Act excluding Indians not taxed. Although most senators agreed that birthright citizenship should not be extended to the Indians, a majority saw no need to clarify the issue, and Doolittle's proposal was voted down. Upon its return to the House of Representatives, the proposed 14th Amendment received little debate, no one spoke in opposition to the Senate's addition of the Citizenship Clause, and the complete proposed amendment was approved by the House on June 13, 1866, and declared to have been ratified on July 28, 1868. In 2006, Goodwin Liu, then an assistant professor at the Bold Hall Law School of the University of California, Berkeley, and later an associate justice of the California Supreme Court, wrote that although the legislative history of the citizenship clause is somewhat thin, the clause's central role is evident in the historical context of the post-Civil War period. Elizabeth Weidra, chief counsel of the Constitutional Accountability Center, a progressive think tank, 
argues that both supporters and opponents of the citizenship clause in 1866 shared the understanding that it would automatically grant citizenship to all persons born in the United States, except children of foreign ministers and invading armies, an interpretation shared by Texas Solicitor General James C. H. O. Richard Ains, Dean of the University of Akron School of Law, takes a different view. Proposing that the citizenship clause had consequences which were unintended by the framers. Citizenship of Chinese persons in the United States. Like many other immigrants, Chinese were drawn to the United States initially to participate in the California Gold Rush of 1849, then moving on to railroad construction, farming, and work in cities. An 1868 treaty, named the Berlin Game Treaty after one of the American negotiators, expanded trade and migration between the United States and China. The treaty did not address the citizenship of children born in the United States to Chinese parents, or vice versa. Regarding naturalization, acquisition of citizenship other than at birth, the treaty contained a provision stating that nothing herein contained shall be held to confer naturalization upon the subjects of China in the United States. Chinese immigrants to the United States were met with considerable distrust, resentment, and discrimination almost from the time of their first arrival. Many politicians argued that the Chinese were so different in so many ways that they not only would never, or even could, assimilate into American culture, but that they represented a threat to the country's principles and institutions. In this climate of popular anti-Chinese sentiment, Congress in 1882 enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act, which placed limits on Chinese immigration to the United States. The original Chinese Exclusion Act was amended several times such as by the 1888 Scott Act and the 1892 Geary Act and as a result it is sometimes referred to in the plural as the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Chinese already in the U.S. were allowed to stay, but they were ineligible for naturalization and, if they left the U.S. and later wished to return, they needed to apply anew and obtain approval again. Chinese laborers and miners were specifically barred from coming, or returning, to the United States under the terms of the law. Citizenship Clause Cases Prior to Wong Kim Ark After the adoption of the 14th Amendment, and prior to the Wong Kim Ark case, the question of Jew solely citizenship for children of aliens arose only with reference to American Indians and Chinese. The Supreme Court ruled in an 1884 case, Elk v. Wilkins, that an Indian born on a reservation did not acquire United States citizenship at birth, because he was not subject to U.S. jurisdiction, and could not claim citizenship later on merely by moving to non-reservation U.S. territory and renouncing his former tribal allegiance. American Indians were subsequently granted citizenship by an act of Congress in 1924. The question of whether the citizenship clause applied to persons born in the United States to Chinese immigrants first came before the courts in an 1884 case, in Re Luk Tin Singh. Luk Tin Singh was born in Mendocino, California in 1870, but after returning from a trip to China in 1884, he was barred from re-entering the United States by officials who objected to his not having met the documentation requirements imposed at the time on Chinese immigrants. Luke's case was heard in the Federal Circuit Court for California by U.S. Supreme Court Associate Justice Stephen J. Field and two other federal judges. Lucy Salyer, a history professor at the University of New Hampshire, writes that Justice Field issued an open invitation to all lawyers in the area to give their opinions on the constitutional questions involved in the case. Field focused on the meaning of the subject to the jurisdiction thereof phrase of the Citizenship Clause, held that Luke was indeed subject to U.S. jurisdiction at the time of his birth despite the alien status of his parents, and on this basis ordered U.S. officials to recognize Luke as a citizen and allow him to enter the United States. The Luke Tin Singh ruling was not appealed and was never reviewed by the Supreme Court. A similar conclusion was reached by the Federal Circuit Court for Oregon in the 1,888 cases of ex part Chin King and ex part Chan San He. In an 1892 case, G. Fook Singh v. U.S., a federal appeals court in California for the same circuit, by this time known as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, 
concluded that a Chinese man would have been recognized as a United States citizen if he could have presented satisfactory evidence that he had in fact been born in the U.S. This case was also never brought before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's 1873 Slaughterhouse Cases decision contained the statement that the phrase, subject to its jurisdiction, was intended to exclude from its operation children of ministers, consuls, and citizens or subjects of foreign states born within the United States. However, since the slaughterhouse cases did not deal with claims of birthright citizenship, this comment was dismissed in Wong Kim Ark and later cases as a passing remark, obiter dictum, lacking any force as a controlling precedent. As to whether the Wong Kim Ark was correct on this point or not, modern scholars are divided. Challenge to Wong Kim Ark's Claim of Citizenship Wong Kim Ark Was born in San Francisco. Various sources state or imply his year of birth as being 1873, 1871, or 1868. His father, Wang Si Ping, and mother, Wei Li, were immigrants from China and were not United States citizens, as the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act made them ineligible for citizenship. Wang worked in San Francisco as a cook. Wang visited China in 1890, and upon his return to the United States in July 1890, he was readmitted without incident because of his U.S. citizenship. In November 1894, Wang sailed to China for another temporary visit, but when he returned in August 1895, he was detained at the port of San Francisco by the collector of customs, who denied him permission to enter the country, arguing that Wang was not a U.S. citizen despite his having been born in the U.S., but was instead a Chinese subject because his parents were Chinese. Wang was confined for five months on steamships off the coast of San Francisco while his case was being tried. According to Salyer, the San Francisco attorney George Collins had tried to persuade the Federal Justice Department to bring a Chinese birthright citizenship case before the Supreme Court. An article by Collins was published in the May-June 1895 American Law Review, criticizing the Luk Tin Singh ruling and the federal government's unwillingness to challenge it, and advocating the international law view of Ju Sanguini's citizenship. Eventually, Collins was able to convince U.S. Attorney Henry Foote, who searched for a viable test case and settled on Wong Kim Ark. With the assistance of legal representation by the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, Wong Kim Ark challenged the refusal to recognize his birth claim to U.S. citizenship, and a petition for a writ of habeas corpus was filed on his behalf in federal district court. The arguments presented before District Judge William W. Morrow centered on which of two competing interpretations of the phrase subject to the jurisdiction thereof in the Citizenship Clause should govern a situation involving a child born in the United States to alien parents. Wang's attorneys argued that the phrase meant subject to the laws of the United States, comprehending, in this expression, the allegiance that aliens owe in a foreign country to obey its laws and interpretation, based on the common law inherited by the United States from England, that would encompass essentially everyone born in the U.S. via the principle of Jew solely, citizenship based on place of birth. The U.S. government claimed that subject to the jurisdiction thereof meant to be subject to the political jurisdiction of the United States and interpretation, based on international law, which would exclude parents and their children who owed allegiance to another country via the principle of Jew sanguinis, citizenship inherited from a parent. The question of the citizenship status of U.S. born children of alien parents had, up to this time, never been decided by the Supreme Court. The U.S. government argued that Wang's claim to U.S. citizenship was ruled out by the Supreme Court's interpretation of jurisdiction in its 1873 Slaughterhouse Cases ruling, but the district judge concluded that the language in question was obiter dictum and not directly relevant to the case at hand. The government also cited a similar statement in Elk v. Wilkins, but the judge was not convinced by this argument either. Wang's attorneys cited the Luk Tin Singh case, and the district judge agreed that in the absence of clear direction from the Supreme Court, this case definitively settled the question of citizenship for Wang and others like him as far as federal courts in the Ninth Circuit were concerned. 
The judge saw the Luk Tin Singh holding reaffirmed in the Ji Fuk Singh case and noted further that another part of the Supreme Court Slaughterhouse case's opinion said that it is only necessary that should be born or naturalized in the United States to be a citizen of the Union. Concluding that the Luk Tin Singh decision constituted a controlling precedent in the Ninth Circuit, Judge Morrow ruled that subject to the jurisdiction thereof referred to being subject to U.S. law, the first of the two proposed interpretations. On January 3, 1896, the judge declared Wong Kim Ark to be a citizen because he was born in the U.S. The U.S. government appealed the district court ruling directly to the United States Supreme Court. According to Salyer, government officials realizing that the decision in this case was of great importance, not just to Chinese Americans, but to all American citizens who had been born to alien parents, and concerned about the possible effect of an early ruling by the Supreme Court on the 1896 presidential election delayed the timing of their appeal so as to avoid the possibility of a decision based more on policy concerns than the merits of the case. Oral arguments before the Supreme Court were held on March 5, 1897. Solicitor General Holmes Conrad presented the government's case, Wong was represented before the court by Maxwell Everts, former U.S. Assistant Attorney General J. Hubley Ashton, and Thomas D. Ryarden. The Supreme Court considered the single question in the case to be whether a child born in the United States, a parent of Chinese descent, who, at the time of his birth, are subjects of the Emperor of China, but have a permanent domicile and residence in the United States, and are there carrying on business, and are not employed in any diplomatic or official capacity under the Emperor of China, becomes at the time of his birth a citizen of the United States. It was conceded that if Wang was a U.S. citizen, the acts of Congress known as the Chinese Exclusion Acts, prohibiting persons of the Chinese race, and especially Chinese laborers, from coming into the United States, do not and cannot apply to him. Opinion of the Court In a 6-2 decision issued on March 28, 1898, the Supreme Court held that Wong Kim Ark had acquired U.S. citizenship at birth and that the American citizenship which Wong Kim Ark acquired by birth within the United States has not been lost or taken away by anything happening since his birth. The opinion of the court was written by Associate Justice Horace Gray and was joined by Associate Justices David J. Brewer, Henry B. Brown, George Chiris Jr., Edward Douglas White, and Rufus W. Peckham. Upholding the concept of Jew solely, citizenship based on place of birth, the court held that the citizenship clause needed to be interpreted in light of English common law, which had included as subjects virtually all native-born children, excluding only those who were born to foreign rulers or diplomats, born on foreign public ships, or born to enemy forces engaged in hostile occupation of the country's territory. The court's majority held that the subject to the jurisdiction phrase in the citizenship clause excluded from U.S. citizenship only those persons covered by one of these three exceptions, plus a fourth single additional exception namely, that Indian tribes not taxed were not considered subject to U.S. jurisdiction. The majority concluded that none of these four exceptions to U.S. jurisdiction applied to Wong, in particular, they observed that during all the time of their said residence in the United States, as domiciled residents therein, the said mother and father of said Wong Kim Ark were engaged in the prosecution of business, and were never engaged in any diplomatic or official capacity under the Emperor of China. Quoting approvingly from an 1812 case, the Schooner Exchange v. M. Fadden, in which Chief Justice John Marshall said, the jurisdiction of the nation within its own territory is necessarily exclusive and absolute and agreeing with the district judge who had heard Wang's original habeas corpus petition that comments in the slaughterhouse cases about the citizenship status of children born to non-citizen parents did not constitute a binding precedent the court ruled that Wang was a U.S. citizen from birth, via the 14th Amendment, and that the restrictions of the Chinese Exclusion Act did not apply to him. An act of Congress, they held, does not trump the Constitution, such a law cannot control meaning, or impair its effect, but must be construed and executed in subordination to its provisions. The majority opinion referred to Calvin's case, 1608, as stating the fundamental common law principle that all people born within the king's allegiance were subjects, 
including children of aliens in Amity. Dissent. Chief Justice Melville Fuller was joined by Associate Justice John Harlan in a dissent which, for the most part, may be said to be predicated upon the recognition of the international law doctrine. The dissenters argued that the history of U.S. citizenship law had broken with English common law tradition after independence citing as an example the embracing in the U.S. of the right of expatriation, giving up of one's native citizenship, and the rejection of the contrary British doctrine of perpetual allegiance. The dissenters argued that the principle of Jews sanguinis, that is, the concept of a child inheriting his or her father's citizenship by descent regardless of birthplace, had been more pervasive in U.S. legal history since independence. Based on an assessment of U.S. and Chinese treaty and naturalization law, the dissenters claimed that the children of Chinese born in this country do not, ipso facto, become citizens of the United States unless the 14th Amendment overrides both treaty and statute. Pointing to the language of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, an act of Congress which declared to be citizens all persons born in the United States and not subject to any foreign power, excluding Indians not taxed, and which was enacted into law only two months before the 14th Amendment was proposed by Congress, the dissenters argued that it is not open to reasonable doubt that the words subject to the jurisdiction thereof, in the amendment, were used as synonymous with the words and not subject to any foreign power. In the dissenters' view, excessive reliance on Jews solely, birthplace, as the principal determiner of citizenship would lead to an untenable state of affairs in which the children of foreigners, happening to be born to them while passing through the country, whether of royal parentage or not, or whether of the Mongolian, Malay, or other race, were eligible to the presidency, while children of our citizens, born abroad, were not. The dissenters acknowledged that other children of foreigners including former slaves had, over the years, acquired U.S. citizenship through birth on U.S. soil. But they still saw a difference between those people and U.S. born individuals of Chinese ancestry, because of strong cultural traditions discouraging Chinese immigrants from assimilating into mainstream American society, Chinese laws of the time which made renouncing allegiance to the Chinese emperor a capital crime, and the provisions of the Chinese Exclusion Act making Chinese immigrants already in the United States ineligible for citizenship. The question for the dissenters was not whether was born in the U.S. or subject to the jurisdiction thereof, but whether his or her parents have the ability, under U.S. or foreign law, statutory or treaty-based, to become citizens of the U.S. themselves. In a lecture to a group of law students shortly before the decision was released, Harlan commented that the Chinese had long been excluded from American society upon the idea that this is a race utterly foreign to us and never will assimilate with us. Without the exclusion legislation, Harlan stated his opinion that vast numbers of Chinese would have rooted out the American population in the western United States. Acknowledging the opposing view supporting citizenship for American-born Chinese, he said that of course, the argument on the other side is that the very words of the Constitution embrace such a case. Commenting on the Wong Kim Ark case shortly after the issuance of the court's ruling in 1898, San Francisco attorney Marshall B. Woodworth wrote that the error the dissent apparently falls into is that it does not recognize that the United States, as a sovereign power, has the right to adopt any rule of citizenship it may see fit, and that the rule of international law does not furnish the sole and exclusive test of citizenship of the United States. Subsequent Developments Contemporary Reactions in an analysis of the Wong Kim Ark case written shortly after the decision in 1898, Marshall B. Woodworth laid out the two competing theories of jurisdiction in the Citizenship Clause and observed that he fact that the decision of the court was not unanimous indicates that the question is at least debatable. Woodworth concluded, however, that the Supreme Court's ruling laid the issue to rest, saying that it is difficult to see what valid objection can be raised thereto. Another analysis of the case, published by the Yale Law Journal, 1898, favored the dissenting view. An editorial published in the San Francisco Chronicle on March 30, 1898, expressed concern that the Wong Kim Ark ruling, issued two days previously, may have a wider effect upon the question of citizenship than the public supposes specifically, 
that it might lead to citizenship and voting rights not only for Chinese, but also Japanese and American Indians. The editorial suggested that it may become necessary, to amend the federal constitution and definitely limit citizenship to whites and blacks. Impact on Wong Kim Ark's family As a result of Wong Kim Ark's U.S. citizenship being confirmed by the Supreme Court, Wong's eldest son came to the United States from China in 1910, seeking recognition as a citizen via Jew Sanguinis, but U.S. immigration officials claimed to see discrepancies in the testimony at his immigration hearing and refused to accept Wong's claim that the boy was his son. Wong's other three sons came to the United States between 1924 and 1926 and were accepted as citizens. Because of his citizenship, Wong Kim Ark's youngest son was drafted in World War II, and later made a career in the United States Merchant Marines. Citizenship Law Since Wong Kim Ark Current U.S. law on birthright citizenship, citizenship acquired at birth, acknowledges both citizenship through place of birth, Ju Soli, and citizenship inherited from parents, Ju Sanguinis. Before Wong Kim Ark, the Supreme Court had held in Elk v. Wilkins, 1884, that birthplace by itself was not sufficient to grant citizenship to a Native American, however, Congress eventually granted full citizenship to American Indians via the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Restrictions on immigration and naturalization of Chinese were event. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.